Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a new session of Stephen Dave's Behind the Curtain. In this series, we explore some of the people who um, are the makers and shakers uh, in the rock and, uh, rock and roll world, um, not the people who are behind the microphones or uh, playing lead guitar up on the stage, but um, songwriters, producers, um, and in this case, session players. We're going to be talking about um, the Wrecking Crew. Uh, this is our second section of the Wrecking Crew um, series, and we'll the, the second of three. So um, today we're going to be talking about the rhythm section. And, um, I, think, I guess, Steve, let's talk, uh, start off talking about um, uh, the bassists. Sure. Uh, so the Wrecking Crew, again, these were the top session muse uh, musicians in LA. They were the best of the best. And they, again, as we've talked about before, they played on everybody's records, everybody's records, um, movie soundtracks, television soundtracks, and so on. Um, but in terms of the basis, there are several of them that, that really stand out. Um, for me, one of the more interesting basis for the Wrecking Crew was a woman named Carol Kay. Uh, Carol Kay um, was um, unique amongst the, the, the Wrecking Crew in that she was one of the few women um, who was consistently involved in the recording sessions. Um, and she was a person who had incredible ability, incredible skill, and also I think a fair amount of perseverance. Um, it was, a, a, I mean, let's be frank, it was, a, you know, the early 60s, for example, it was a, a difficult era for, for women in a number of ways, but it, it couldn't have been and it probably wasn't easy for Carol Kay to go into that, uh, into that room every day. But that being said, um, when you hear accounts of Carol Kay and you hear other members of the Wrecking Group talking about um, Carol Kay. She was, it was, it was family, right? It was family. Uh, there was a good natured kind of back and forth, but it was a, they were there to do a job. Uh, they were there to, to get those, <clears throat> those sounds on tape. And uh, there wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of horsing around. There wasn't a lot of, you know, difficulty in that regard, as you might imagine, it would have been the case for women in other fields in, in the early 1960s. So, yeah, so, so they, she was she was kind of one of the, one of the guys. Uh, I think that's uh, fair. Yeah, and and uh, kind of a sister figure. Uh, that doesn't mean that she never heard any sexist comments or anything like that's that. Right. But um, just in general, uh, she she broke in. She actually got her start um, uh, with a steel guitar uh, that her uh, bought at the age of thirteen. And um, a, a year later, she was already giving lessons um, to other people who were learning guitar. Um, from there, she went on to do uh, some work in, in some jazz, uh, right. with some jazz groups. Um, in fact, she, uh, she basically said, and this is true of like most of the, the people that I've heard from the Wrecking Crew being interviewed, they talk about uh, their aspirations and their and their first love was with jazz music, and that's uh, that's where a lot of them got their start. That's where a lot of them uh, had their hearts. But Absolutely. In, in the '60s, uh, pop music meant meant rock music, and uh, so that's where the money was. And a lot of them never even warmed up to rock music. Um, and I think. Uh, Carol Kay is an exception to that, but she does say, you know, playing playing rock bass is uh, essentially just playing a dumbed down version of of jazz bass or, no, I, or jazz. Yeah, rock. I think yeah, I think that that's it's super interesting that that um, that so many of these musicians came from again from this world of jazz, and I think her perspective, I think again as you're suggesting, was shared by many. And much of what she was uh, presented with um, day in and day out, and you can see an image of her here in the studio, wasn't really all that sophisticated. Um, but the interesting thing about Carol Kay uh, was that she was able to, to give a kind of, a kind of flair to, to many things that she was a part of. That, and she was there to do a job and, you know, and she wasn't there to, you know, to, to noodle around and to, to draw attention to her playing. But 
she could find moments where you know she could really so demonstrate a kind of flair that engineers, producers, and performers, right, the artists themselves, said that, that we want we want more of that. And so she was um, really, I think, a, a, at the heartbeat of the Wrecking Crew. I think, as oftentimes the case with rhythm sections, but she was really a kind of key member uh, in so many sessions. That's right. And 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 before we talk about uh, that heartbeat, uh, it's it's also worth mentioning that uh, when she started doing session work, she started off as uh, a, a guitarist and um, some guitar work that uh, in itself was very impressive. She played guitar on uh, La Bamba. Uh, That's amazing. Yeah, she played, amazing. she played guitar for, uh, for Phil Spector and you've lost that loving feeling of the Righteous Brothers. Right, which which is not an easy thing to do because Phil Spector was notoriously hard on the guitarists, and so he always had very kinds of high expectations and plenty of suggestions for guitarists. And so, yeah, that was no small that was no small feat. Um, she also played she played on a number of um, some things, but she played guitar on "I Got You, Babe." So that was her guitar work. She played twelve string guitar uh, even. Yeah. Uh, on on the the Zappa album, freak out. That's amazing. No, it's amazing. From guitar. Yeah, and, and again, real quickly, Zappa was um, well. He was an exacting. He was an exacting musician. He was an extraordinary taskmaster. His ex expectations were just you know through the roof. And so, if you were on a Zappa album, you were you were an extraordinary musician. And right. So that's that's. Ex that's incredibly high praise for for her just to demonstrate her versus and, and Zappa is one of the, Zappa is one of the people who um, just sings the praises of the Wrecking Crew uh, musicians uh, any chance it gets he he just holds them in, in incredibly high esteem um, so she was doing that work before she found her way uh, to bass and she ended up uh, started off replacing a bass player that uh, didn't show up one day and um, kind of found that that was her niche. She had a chance to to uh, do some improvising. In those days, um, these session players were often only given um, some charts. Yeah. Um, were kind of expected to improvise a little bit and, and yeah. to be kind of um, part of the arrangement that they that they would um, invent their their portion of the arrangement, which works especially well if you're working with other musicians that you know you know what they're going to do you know what to do. That's right. And um, so that's one of the reasons that the Wrecking Crew became um, so important is because people knew, all right, you know, we can go in there with kind of an idea of a song. And they're going to they're going to give us uh, a complete composition by the time we're done. So. Well, that's that, that's right. So I mean, so she was uh, really at the heart of the action, really from the from the earliest earliest days of the Wrecking Crew. Again, um, the Wrecking Crew was this kind of loose assembly of musicians, um, but every account of the Wrecking Crew puts her really much very much at the at the heart of um, heart of the action. Um, do you, Dave, do you want to talk talk a little bit about her relationship with with Brian Wilson? Um, Brian Wilson was enamored with the Wrecking Crew. I mean, he, uh, I mean, it, it's fair to say that Brian Wilson really learned about recording by, frankly, just hanging around the, the, these studios. But Carol Kay brought something to Brian Wilson's music that he thought was really exceptional, and, and they had a, a very interesting relationship. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was kind of a, a mutual admiration club. Um, they they both had incredibly high respect for for the other. Um, she said of him that he wrote some of the most incredible uh, bass lines uh, that she had ever seen in terms of just intricate and um, right. very sophisticated stuff. And so she really uh, admired. Uh, his genius, and of course, when you talk about Brian Wilson, genius is the word you hear all the time. But he also um, just thought the world of her, and he used her 
in everything. Um, starting off with uh, the early surf music, I get around um, California girls, that sort of thing, uh, through pet sounds and and good vibrations, and it, she was always there. Well, that's exactly right. She was a integral <clears throat> part of the of the Beach Boy sound, and which is interesting again because um, Brian was was a bass player. Uh, he, he played he played bass. He understood then the importance of bass, and he really appreciated what she brought to the table. Um, her work on Good Vibrations is, I think, quite, quite famous. Um, one of the things that Carol Kay was known for was her use of a, of a pick. Most bass players, most bass players um, use their, their fingers. Uh, this was a, the jazz technique, and um, this is just how uh, players were, were taught. This is how they learned. This is just sort of, but she oftentimes used a pick, and the pick was used to great effect on a number of Beach Boys uh, tunes, but but most notably, I think, uh, Good Vibrations, that her base work on Good Vibrations. Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, it, it, just talking about the pick, uh, of course, a lot of bass players uh, from that time came from the upright, and uh, the idea of using a pick on the upright w was absurd. You know, so they were, and, and when they went to electric bass, they just kind of used the same sort of fingering and things like that. Carol Kay came from the guitar uh, as a guitar player and uh, playing that with the pick, of course, and, and just continued doing that. Um, but it's a, it creates a very, a very clean, very distinct uh, bass sound. And um, a number of bassists uh, have, have uh, adapted that. Um, Joe Osborne, uh, who is another member right. of the Rick and Crew, also played with Pick. Absolutely. Um, so, um, on on good vibrations. Now, just talking about that song for a moment. Uh, the sessions of Good Vibrations uh, went for weeks. They they did. A number of sessions uh, for good vibrations. Right. The cost for the studio time and the session players and so on exceeded the cost of the entire Pet Sounds album. Yes. Right. For that one song, uh, and, and Pet Sounds was not a cheap album to make. No, it, uh, it was You're also right. an expensive <laughs> album, um, but. Uh, Brian Wilson uh, indulged himself uh, here. Um, the record company was was not particularly pleased, uh, but for me, uh, Good Vibrations may be the high point, the high watermark of the Beach Boys. Uh, I I'd agree. I'd agree with that. You know, it's uh, the again, Good Vibrations for many, many, many years was considered was the the highest. Uh, the, the most expensive single, I mean, in, in the history of music for, for a long time. And to some degree, it, as you described the, the endless sessions, it was um, sort of like Brian Wilson was sort of chasing this white whale and don't know that anybody was really certain how it would all turn out. Um, including Brian Wilson. I, and including Brian Wilson, yeah. There, there are stories of, of, of them getting together for a session for him coming in and saying, um, let's try this. They would try it. He said, hmm, hmm. Uh, let me think about that. The session would be over. Uh, you know, they, they paid these musicians to come for the session for, for yeah. three hours. Uh, it'd be over after 20 minutes. And um, they'd get together the next day and he would have some new idea based on what he heard the day before. This is, yeah. Stuff like that. And that's it just that's not how things were done back then uh, because it was prohibitively expensive. No, that's exactly right. I, I think it's also fair to say that this was the uh, this was also the moment where Brian Wilson had was undergoing. I mean, it started it started a, a decline for him. I mean, uh, Brian Wilson's genius is he's a very very complex individual, um, and I think that the good vibration good vibration sessions did suggest that there was something maybe a miss uh, slightly amiss with with Brian. But again, the proof is in the pudding, and that song, as I as you suggest, I think it it is really the high watermark for the uh, 
for the group. I don't think any question about that. You know, the, the base work for Carol Kay, the, the, the theremin, it's very inventive um, and, and psychedelic yet poppy yet, you know, eminently hummable. There's just something about it that's just really, really amazing. Just really quickly, um, Lyle Ritz, who was also um, a bass player, uh, played a little bit of ukulele as well, um, but he played uh, bass on Good Vibrations. And um, he, he often mentions that. I mean, if you were involved in the production of Good Vibrations, this is one of the things that you're going to, one of the stories you're going to tell. Um, but uh, a number of people said, well, you know, wait a second, Carol Kay said she did it. Um, yeah. You say you did it. What, what's the story? Yeah. Well, they were both doing it. Uh, she was on her, her Fender um, and he was on Upright. So Brian Wilson had, had two bass players go there, um, which apparently was not even that unusual. Um, no, apparently not. For, not for him. Um, but that's another uh, member of the uh, Wrecking Crew rhythm section. Mm -hmm. um, he was known for playing uh, Fender uh, with with uh, Herb Albert on the Tijuana Brass as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or some people, yeah. You know, Glenn Campbell uh, at, at that point when when Good Vibrations came out. He was uh, starting his own career as a, a, a single uh, star, as a, as a television personality. Um, so he was no longer working with the Beach Boys. He said when he heard good vibrations on the radio, he was just blown away. He had just yeah, it's... Uh, had not that sort of thing uh, was possible in pop music, so. Well, on, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and honestly, if, even nearly fifty years later, there is something about the vibrations that is singular. That there is something about the, that work that is, um, yeah. The remain it's it's a challenging yet you know compelling yet kind of affirming yet you, you, something you warm to yet it's just there's there's something about that that's just really a mark of a genius. And again, the playing on it is superb in the Wrecking Crew, Carol Kay et al., right? Well, they, they made it happen for Brian Wilson, without question. Yeah. And um, as you suggested, uh, I, I think his uh, introdu introduction to, to session players, um, that, was, that was a revelation for, for Brian Wilson. Um, Jan and Dean uh, took his uh, Surf City uh, and, and turned it into a song that he never uh, expected it could be. And um, Jan told him, the session guys, they, they took it and ran with it. And, and you can do that, do the same thing. And so that and, and, and his admiration for Phil Spector Kind of ushered him into the uh, into the studio, and uh, he played it like an instrument. You know, so yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think it, I mean Brian Wilson, genius, all of that, right? But without the Wrecking Crew, um, if Brian Wilson had to rely on his brothers and cousin, and you know now Jardine and right, you know all this, if he had to rely on the actual Beach Boys. Um, they, they would not have, you know. I don't know if we'd even be talking about the Beach Boys today. I, yeah, I just, you know, there's something about the Wrecking Crew that took um, Wilson's music obviously to that next level and just made it, you know, part of a, the soundtrack of a, of a generation and all of that. But boy, I mean, Wilson clearly benefited from their expertise, the, the Wrecking Crew. Right, and, and I, I, I agree with you. I don't know that we would have heard much about the Beach Boys at all. They'd be a... Uh, kind of a little footnote. Uh, I think so too. <clears throat> a little garage and, band, in Southern you know. Uh, yes, and uh, those guys um, kind of resented being uh, replaced uh, yeah, in the studio. Did. Yeah, they did at first, but you know, clearly the results of of that uh, were so convincing that um, that that 
reaction and, and, and that resistance to other people playing um, solved very quickly. Well, they were they were smart guys. Um, they may have had their feelings hurt, but they they understood what the benefits were, and so. Well, Dennis Wilson even had Hal Blaine play, play the drums on his solo album. Yeah, Pacific Ocean Blue, right? Yeah, so, I mean, so he knows a good one thing when he when he when he heard it. So, I mean, why wouldn't you? Um, so, we is there anything? Uh, wh where, where do we head next? Do we have anything? What more do you want to say about Carol Kay? A couple more words about Carol Kay. Um, like Tommy Tedesco, uh, who we talked about last week uh, or last time, um, the the most single famous uh, guitarist from the Wrecking Crew, she played on a, a number of um, television uh, songs as well. Um, played on Mission Impossible. Um, yeah, the the famous bass line from Mission Impossible was what was her baby. Um, and, uh, well, and she did that with Earl Palmer, by the way, Earl Palmer kind of, kind of her in, um, she, she referred to him as her best friend, um, back in the early days, uh, they, they were very close and, um, he, uh, in one of the early sessions, he, he kind of took her aside and said, well, you know, you play fantastic. And, uh, she said, I know. She, she said that she was very cocky back then. <laughs> but he said, but, but you're playing a little fast. Um, you're rushing it. Yeah. And she said, she listened to the playback. She said, I'm not rushing it. But she listened to it again. And yeah, she was rushing it. So she, yeah. she yeah. went worked with the metronome again and things like this. So this is one of the things that Earl Palmer um, did for her. And, and um, he was uh, playing with her together on the Mission Impossible uh, thing. She also did bass for Hawaii Five O. Yeah, Ash, the Adams Family, the Brady Bunch. Um, so, so there was there was that going on as well. Um, she played on River Deep Mountain High. Uh, so, oh, the the ill fated River Deep Mountain High, the, the song that broke ill fated <laughs> broke Phil, Phil the song that broke Phil Spector. Yeah, <laughs> no, it really did. But but yeah. Um, she also, uh, in addition to all her playing, she also was um, involved in education, music education. And she wrote uh, or put together a, a really a, a number of best-selling books about the bass guitar, you know, a, a series of, you know, how to learn the bass, um, which I think introduced the bass to thousands of people all over the world. I mean, and she's, she took that education piece very, very seriously. And so uh, even in, even um, in recent decades, I mean, she's really, been pretty proactive about teaching the bass to to young people in particular. So, I mean, there's that part of her legacy as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and as you say, uh, that's been what she's been concentrating on for the last, last several decades. Um, but uh, yeah, so she she is when you talk about uh, the Wrecking Crew, she is the uh, bassist, uh, much as Tommy Tedesco is the guitarist. I think and that's right. Hal Blaine is the drummer. So um, we can use that as a little segue um, to talk about uh, our drummers. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Who, 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 talks, who should we talk about first, Dave? Of the drummer. Well, let's let, let's go ahead and talk about Earl Palmer because he right. uh, he was kind of there um, at the beginning. Um, Hal Blaine talks about Earl Palmer as someone who brought him in, who uh, offered him opportunities um, for things that he said, you know, I can't take the session. Why don't, why don't you do it? Um, so he was uh, someone who, who offered opportunities to Hal Blaine, opened the door for him. And uh, Hal Blaine even calls him his mentor. So uh, clearly Earl Palmer was a, a very important uh, figure, uh, especially in the in the early years, yes. Um, uh, mentor and friend to Carol Kay and and uh, Hal Blaine, so that's that's no small thing. No, that's that's um, absolutely right. Yeah, he well, played 
Yeah, go ahead, Dave. What was his background? I mean, how did he kind of get into to all this? I mean, what, well, what, what were his roots? What kind of music? Well, it's it, jazz, like like everyone, yeah. everyone else. It was just he came from a jazz background, and um, he dumbed it down a little bit <laughs> to to do what they needed in the sessions. Um, and I don't think he ever, ever really learned to love rock and roll. Um, but that's, yeah, that's certainly my impression as well, Dave. I mean, you, the, the interviews you read and, and the accounts about Palmer was that he was that um, that rock and roll, that kind of music was his, was his job, was his day job or whatever. Um, and it, it certainly paid the bills. But he had, he seemed to have precious little passion for uh, for rock music, for pop music. Um, I. I don't know if that if it was you, there was this sense that it was a little bit beneath him in terms of his skill set that like you're suggesting that it was you know he came from a world of um, more complex rhythms with jazz and, and more you know higher expectations perhaps for jazz drummers and you know just keeping the beat on these songs was okay it paid the bills but just not something he was ever all that inspired by um, he strikes me in the, in the interviews that I've seen in the accounts I've read as someone who uh, really saw that his wrecking crew job as as that, and really very much as a as a kind of job that it did not um, it did not move him emotionally in any kind of profound way. This was, you know, clock in clock out kind of deal. He did did great work, but when when that session was over, you know, it it was over, and there we go. Yeah. 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 And and. You can hear Carol Kay talk about things in a similar way. Um, as a session player, she was making five to ten times as much as she made in a band on the road. Um, and she uh, is often quoted as saying uh, she was earning more than the president of the United States. Yeah, that's right. Um, and they were doing three or four sessions a day, um, 12 hour days. Um, and, and, and these people were, were booked for months in advance. So it was uh, incredibly high pressure and so on, but at least, at least she uh, kind of enjoyed what she was bringing to it. She, yes. she knew that she was making a contribution uh, and, and making these songs better. She talked about yeah. uh, on the Wichita alignment, uh, her bass uh, starts that off. Dun, 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 right. Dun, dun. Yeah, that's right. Um, and she talks about walking into a drugstore one day and, and hearing that playing uh, on the uh, on the PA system and started crying. Yeah, it's it, it just moved her so much to know uh, that she had been responsible for that. It, it, and and again, I mean, all the wrecking crew would have had this experience where, you know, they walk into a drugstore, or hear, turn on the radio, that's this kind of thing. Um, and it was, I think, for all the time, all the time. All the time. And, 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 and sometimes are really, I think, frankly, as you're suggesting, a really emotional experience. But in the case of Palmer, um, he was involved in, in session work, um, frankly, all over the country, but clearly also in, 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 in Los Angeles. But there was there became a point when he no longer was sort of the, the sort of the go-to uh, drummer within that within the Wrecking Crew, um, and he sort of moved in his own direction, um, which I think yeah, that's kind right. Of, yeah, talk. It, it, it might be worth it might be worth mentioning before we uh, go to talk about the elephant in the room um, that uh, Palmer was known as the. Uh, the inventor of um, the swamp beat. Yeah. Now, yeah, I have no idea what that means, but um, that was one of the things that he was credited with. So I no, that's was... right. Yeah, and every account you read of Palmer, yeah, I mean, inevitably, there's the yeah, the swamp beat is is part of it. Yeah. Um, all right. So Palmer then becomes less important, and uh, a figure within the Wrecking Crew sort of rises to prominence and. Um, this drummer becomes not only the, you know, not only the drummer, uh, but also to some degree kind of the, the face of the, of the, the wrecking crew. Uh, and that's, and that's, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Hal Blaine. Um, you want to talk? Yeah. So 
Yeah, Hal Blaine. Well, he was a good looking guy. So if you're going to have a face, uh, you might as well have a face like Hal Blaine's. And um, he was um, a drummer's drummer. Uh, and above all, uh, he was a session player drummer. And that's a special breed because there's all sorts of things that um, that a session player drummer has to take into consideration that uh, a, a drummer for, uh, for a live show um, doesn't have to worry about. Um, and in fact, this is one of the things, when he started recording uh, with the Carpenters, um, the Mama Carpenter uh, was in the studio and really satisfied. She wanted to know why on earth Karen couldn't play the drums on their own recordings because uh, she had seen drummers on TV all the time and, and Karen was as good as any one of them. And, um, and he's, you know, she, she is quite good. And, uh, but there's, there are special things that a session drummer has to pay attention to. And it's not something that you can just walk into a studio and do. Um, so uh, that was one of the things that he, uh, that he did for the Carpenters. Another one, uh, according to his own account, is that he, um, he got Karen to sing a tone lower. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, he did. So this is the, this is the, this is the, uh, the legend, right? That it's how Blaine, right. that, uh, how, um, whatever, sort of reconfigured her voice to get her, you know, to hit, try to kind of get that lower octave kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now there's, okay, the you know, I know you, I know you're skeptical about this. Um, uh, completely skeptical, 100% skeptical. But the reason I think it sounds like it, you know, it, it could be is because I think he has enough things. Uh, that he could brag about just you can tell stories all day if you're Hal Blaine and uh, just have all sorts of credit. Uh, but other people talk about uh, Shelton, for instance, said, you know, Hal Blaine came up to me during one session and said, I, I like your playing. I think you're doing a great job. I think you've got a great, great future uh, too but you're playing a little bit ahead of the beat. And you know, that's a lot of guitars do it, but you got to realize that in the studio, the drummer is God. And he said, okay, I, I took that advice and, and uh, was better, better guitar player for it. And other people talk about ways in which he was helpful that it just, a kind word or taking them inside and, and saying something that was just sure. Some, so he Absolutely. was clearly a very giving, a very generous type of person. Um, and, and trying to be helpful to, um, to the other musicians. A lot like, yeah. uh, we heard about Tommy Tedesco as well. It, it seemed to be the, the sort of thing that these guys um, were known for. Uh, could have been huge assholes. They could have been, you know, egomaniacs. Um, but they were looking out for the people that uh, that they were working with, and I, I think that says a lot about them. No, I, one hundred percent, and I would agree that uh, there are plenty of stories about Hal Blaine and his generosity, um, his ear. He had a kind of uh, an arranger sensibility. Uh, as a drummer, he knew how the how these things kind of would come together. And undoubtedly, he was able then to identify certain characteristics for an individual musician and maybe offer some suggestions. Uh, I, again, I think that the Karen Carpenter uh, suggestion um, is, well, I mean, it's really quite, that's quite an achievement. I mean, to, to be the one to- Apocryphal. Yeah. It's I apocryphal. Mean, yeah. So, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to demean Hal Blaine or diminish his abilities. Um, he really was very much the centerpiece for the uh, <clears throat> for the wrecking crew along again with, you mentioned uh, Tommy Tedesco. 
What what is it about? I mean, as you would describe Hal Blaine and his kind of personality, I mean, how would you describe him? Um, what 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 kind of what are some personality features that would kind of emerge from this guy that make him, you know, make him a kind of leader? How would we how would we well, see? Um, he had a sense of humor. Uh, he he also um, had a, had a sense of, of purpose and and uh, getting the job done. Uh, that's that's one of the things that uh, when those guys got in and, and got down to work, it was amazing how well uh, things would just click and and, and come together. Uh, and, and maybe uh, yeah. Not a fan of jazz uh, at all, but but maybe there is something to that. That if you're if you've got the chops to play jazz music, um, you have the virtuosity to just kind of come in and and sit down and, and play in um, in a pop session uh, without just being overly challenged um, and. I think that probably has a lot to do with it. Um, Hal Blaine came, had a start with uh, with the Rat Pack. He uh, talks about uh, about working with them. He said that was always yeah. a blast. Um, that they that they would always have uh, all sorts of visitors in the studio just watching. Oh, of course, and, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, their entourage would be there, and he talks about a, a session with Dean Martin, where um, a couple of the secretaries that, that come down to watch. Uh, <laughs> the sound engineer said, "All right, listen, okay, we're going to be starting now. Everybody, be quiet." And uh, he said, "We were playing, and Dean was singing, and someone was talking in the studio, and oh, so Dean stopped singing, and everybody stops playing." And this woman is talking to her name. Yeah, I called her on Thursday. And I told her she'd come over. My... <laughs> and he said, Dean looked at her and walked over and sat on her lap and said, honey, we, we said we'd need to just be quiet and not talk while we're doing this. And it's important you understand that. Because um, I'd hate to have to send you out. Uh, he said, he was just the sweetest guy about it. Sure. They went back to recording. Nobody said anything anymore. But he said, yeah, recording with the Rat Pack was always fun. Um, to, with Frank Sinatra or Nancy Sinatra, uh, first time that he worked with them, Frank came in with Big Barrow and his little entourage. But they always booked a double session, two, three-hour sessions. And in the first session, uh, the players would just go over the music. Yeah, and um, in the second session, Frank would come in, and this was all done back then, um, all together. The, the The singer would sing while the band was playing, and that would all be uh, in in one session. Uh, there were not the overdubs and so on that yeah. that are standard now, um, but they do. The band has to be ready to go because, you know, if there are squeaky chairs or anything like that, it's going to end up on the on the record because Frank's going to come in and he's going to lay down a vocal track and then he's out of there. Yeah, well, that's that's it. You're going to see. You know, yeah. So so it has to work the first time. And that's why they, they always put the double session. The. Uh, uh, yeah, they, Hal Blaine was famous for his ability to, his almost chameleon-like ability to take on a, almost kind of different roles as a drummer. Um, he could, I mean, I think it's fair to say, I mean, even with your stories there, I think it's fair to say that he could play, he played for everyone and he could play everything. Um, and there's really quite an amazing story about someone, a great famous drummer, right? Now you can talk a little bit about the, the Charlie the Charlie Watts story regarding Hal Blaine, which I think is really it's really interesting, very illuminating. I think. Well, yeah, um, Charlie Watts said he was amazed to find out that his three favorite drummers were the same guy. Uh, 
Hal yeah. Blaine. Um, so, yeah, uh, and and he he had a unique drum set uh, that he put together. Um, he had uh, well a set of of eight concert tom toms uh, set up in a row above his uh, above his bass drum. And um, I guess the first time that he, he played this on, on television on the Ed Sullivan show um, with, with Nancy Sinatra playing the drummer man. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. And uh, so he's playing this. He's also got his, uh, his fiberglass uh, Hal Blamer shells. And it's, it's a, basically he put together his own drum set and then uh, the drum company is it what is Gibson? Is that the drum? Those are the drum people. Uh. Um, well, bunch bunch of drum. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, in this case, I don't know that it was Gibson. Well, okay. anyway, uh, but yeah, some of, some drum company essentially took his setup and 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 reproduced it without giving any credit. But yeah, it's. Um, it, but it was the Hal Bl Hal Blaine drum set, yeah. The Hal Blaine, the Hal Blaine, Hal Blaine kit. The um, Blaine is, um, I mean, he was pretty a transparent guy, and again, probably the most loquacious of those in the Wrecking Crew. It seems to me. I mean, he, there's, um, he he talked endlessly about his time uh, in in the Wrecking Crew. Do you, Dave? You want to talk a little bit though about um, sort of. Hal Blaine's kind of personal journey, which is actually, I think, quite, quite fascinating in its own way, I think, quite harrowing, um, because uh, you mentioned, right, that, that these session musicians were actually well compensated, and at a certain point, they're making really good money. Um, oh, he had, and he Hal had a Blaine mansion. living a good had, life. Yeah, go ahead. He had a Rolls Royce. Uh, he had a yacht. Um, and um, he, he had a very expensive divorce. And, and lost most of those things, uh, or all of them, actually. Um, yeah, California was a joint property state. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it was a, a time when, when just the session playing was starting to peter out. Right. And um, there was a, a time that where he had lost everything. And he was yeah. living in Arizona as a security guard. And it's just, you know, like thinking about suicide because it's just, he it, it just hit rock bottom. You yeah, it all crumbled, yeah. At the heights of, a, of, of Music Olympus, you know, he won seven Grammys in a row um, for playing on, on various things um, that, that incredible the year, you know, and uh, so he had. He had these Grammys, he had these gold records, he had to sell his gold records, uh, things like that. So yeah, he had a tough time. And then, um, and then he was able to kind of have a comeback. Um, and that That's comeback right. was uh, a little bit uh, of self-publicity. He, he wrote a book, The Wrecking Crew. Yes. And talked about his, his time as a session player and, uh, and it was essentially rediscovered as as a drummer that i think i think that's i think that's fair and that that happened that rediscovery happened sort of in the 21st century it's um i mean the wrecking crew again the golden era of the wrecking crew is the 1960s and then uh, the the work uh went to other musicians and in other directions and by the time we get to the mid 1970s the wrecking crew is largely no more well and apart from the fact that that just the band started playing their own music well that's a huge you, part you actually of yes of course you know that was part of it as well that's, that's uh, absolutely the case. The rock and roll that be, that started to become kind of the expectation <laughs> that if you had a rock and roll group, you're playing your music, you know, and um, that changed. So I, th I think though that it, it that Hal Blaine had, and then you mentioned his book. I think he had a huge role in sort of the rediscovery of the Wrecking Crew. I think that um, he, along with Tommy Tedesco and Tedesco's uh, son, um, began to be much more proactive about. Uh, publicizing the wrecking, wrecking crew's achievements 
I, mean, I think the people in California in the music industry understood the Wrecking Crew, but I think people on the outside just really didn't. And it's only in the past few decades that we have, I think, a clearer sense of the Wrecking Crew's influence. And I think Hal Blaine had a huge role in that because he was, I mean, he loved, you know, he loved to talk. He was a loquacious guy. He was a, he was a kind of a ham, but he, he also had great affection for his fellow musicians and understood what they had. They were on, they were on Olympus, right? They had achieved an incredible amount. And like you suggest, I mean, Hal Blaine himself had one, one amazing thing after the, the other in terms of his own career, but simply just to publicize, simply to talk about it, I think made an enormous influence. And I think both Hal Blaine and, and, and the Tedesco's, I mean, that's why we know about the record crew today because of their, their work. Hal Blaine, well, like Tommy Tedesco, um, is probably the most, the single most recorded guitarist uh, in history. Uh, I think it's probably safe to say that Hal Blaine is as well. He played on 30,000 um, pieces of music. Uh, <laughs> recorded. How do you achieve numbers like I that? Mean, you know, it's just yeah. incredible. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're right. I think it's, I think you're probably absolutely spot on with this, that he is, you know, he's on more recordings than any other drummer. I mean, I'm sure that- And, and the, probably the same thing's true for Carol Kane. Uh, yeah, who, I mean- What, what basis has been uh, in more recordings than, than her? Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine. So, now, there are, okay, so in terms of the rhythm section, um, you did have a number of, I mean, clearly kind of seminal figures. But there were lots of people who were playing on these records, um, playing bass, bass, playing percussion, playing other percussion instruments. Um, you want to talk about a couple of people of note that, that have jumped out at you as you've kind of thought more about the Wrecking Crew, people that have really kind of struck your interest? Well, uh, if we're talking about bassists, um, Joe Osborne uh, also yeah. should be mentioned. I think so uh, he was Ricky Nelson was part of Ricky Nelson's uh, band and um, uh, played with Johnny River uh, on the, the Whiskey A Go Go. Um, basically, he basically discovered the Carpenters, uh, actually, uh, for, for AM Records uh, and uh, uh, was, was uh, an important part of, of developing. Uh, their career and, and their sound. Uh, he brought Hal Blaine uh, into the Carpenter Project uh, after um, uh, Ticket to Ride, which was their first uh, single and first album. Yeah, that's right. The first album, the, the Beatles cover. Yeah. Right. Fact, uh, a, a modest which, which did, it did all right. You know, it broke into the, the top, the hot hundred. Um, but um, the album itself had cost like fifty thousand dollars, and and uh, just wasn't really a success. They brought Hal Blaine in, and and he uh, he he told Karen how to sing, and then everything. Well, there we go. You know, <laughs> you know the Joe the Joe Osborne uh, story is is interesting too because he also had sort of a second career as a studio musician in Nashville. Um, as famous as he was in the Wrecking Crew in L.A., you know, playing on the Monkees and the Fifth Dimension and Grassroots and all these, these records. Then in the 70s and 80s, he went out to, to Nashville where he played on, you know, Dolly Parton records, uh, Oak Ridge Boys, you know, Kenny Rogers, um, you name it, he, he played on it. And uh, in fact, uh, Joe Osborne is, um, is part of the Country Music Hall of Fame as, as well. And so he's a, an extraordinarily kind of... Um, versatile session player in that regard and very much a kind of go-to bassist whether you're in uh, California or whether you're in Tennessee. I mean he really was, he spanned a couple of, of genres. I mean he played on everything for everyone at, at some point or another. He passed away just a couple of years ago but really extraordinarily influential guy. Well as long as we're talking about Hall of Fame it, it's worth mentioning that uh, both Earl Palmer and uh, Hal Blaine were um, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for for their life work. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, talking a little bit more about um, about percussion, um, 
with Roy, Roy Pullman, also a, a, a bassist um, who's also involved in uh, Wall of Sound and uh, yeah, uh, Beach Boys and, and the sort of stuff that the Wrecking Crew was involved in. Um, on, on percussion, you, you had um, people like um, Gary Coleman, who, uh, who played the vibraphone. Um, he played on things like, uh, well, Carol Kay actually, actually um, kind of brought him into session work um, and said, you know, I've got, I've got this thing going on, come with me. Um, she invited him to, to a party at her place. And he did some networking and, and, and got some jobs. Uh, and so through, through her, he, he got involved in, uh, in session work as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. best known, um, for, um, his work on bridge over troubled water. There's uh, the vibraphone, uh, in that, yeah. um, he came from an Andy, uh, Andy Williams session and Hal Blaine basically waved him over and said, Hey, we can use your help here. And so he took his vibraphone down the hall to another studio. Um, Paul Simon was in there, said, hey, hi, how you doing? Shook his hand, told him what they did, and he played it and left and um, heard it later on the radio and really liked we go. Uh, how it sounded. <laughs> Have vibraphone, will travel. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, this is, yeah. Welcome to the Wrecking Crew. Um, and then uh, Hal did, uh, Hal Blaine did the, the Tom Tom overdubs on that, uh, as well. Uh, Larry Knechtel, uh, played the, uh, uh, incredible piano part, but we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, next time. Um, then we had, um, well, we've already talked about Earl Tom, uh, Frank Cap. um, Drums on I, I Got You, Babe. Oh, of course. Uh, so there, yeah, there were a number of people, of course, because yeah, uh, there was so that they could not, the, the big three, let's say, uh, couldn't cover it all. And if you have someone, a producer like Brian Wilson or Phil Spector with his wall of sound, uh, Phil Spector had like three pianists he had yeah um drummers and other percussionists uh he had uh, six guitarists it was a wall of sound it was uh he wanted lots of musicians and lots of music to make a lot of sound and so that's uh he needed session players you lots needed of them and you needed to know what they were doing and so to that point then um on our next our next segment of Behind the Curtain, we're gonna look at the, the Wrecking Crew and uh, other members of the Wrecking Crew, including keyboardists. Um, and this will give us a chance um, to talk about the, the, the amazing Leon Russell, who, um, Leon Russell lived a number of different lives, um, but one of the things that Leon Russell did um, was become really sort of the, kind of a, the band leader of note in the late 60s, early 1970s, uh, traveling uh, with uh, people like Joe Cocker, for example, is Leon Russell, who was at the center of Cocker's Mad Dogs of Englishmen. Um, but we need to talk about keyboardists next week. Um, we also maybe give us a chance to talk about some of the, some of the producers, some of the people who were also uh, working the dials. And engineers, and, yes. And engineers uh -huh. back in the day. So people like uh, Bones Howe and, and, and many others, right? Who are- Jack Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche, yeah, Nietzsche, we have to, yeah, Nietzsche's an, an essential part of all this. And Nietzsche has then tremendous influence in the recording industry into the 70s and 80s, well beyond the Wrecking Crew golden years. So that's where we're headed. We're going to talk in the, the next edition about um, some more performers and some more people who are behind the glass, if you will. Um, and that's that's happening soon. And so, um, Dave, you want to point our, um, our friends to uh, the playlists and... Um, the subscription and those kinds of things. Sure. Um, uh, as always, we're going to uh, have a um, a playlist for for this session uh, where we 
show some of the uh, the songs that we've been talking about. Uh, always very important, and I recommend it highly. Um, you can find that here. Uh, you can find uh, other behind the curtain uh, videos here. And um, if you want to subscribe, which I highly recommend, absolutely that here. Okay, cool. All right, so thanks everybody, and uh, we will we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye now.